From humble beginnings, Leonardo DiCaprio has become one of the most recognized actors of all time. An only child to a hard-working single mother, he came by his unusual name because his pregnant mother, Ermelin, was gazing at a painting by Leonardo da Vinci when she first felt him kick. The talented teenager grew up in the City of Dreams, Los Angeles, and got his first acting break when he was just 16. Six years later, it was an unlikely Shakespearean film that shot the young actor to international fame. Baz Luhrmann's ultra-modern Romeo and Juliet paired him with rising star Claire Danes, and Leonardo found that a star-crossed lover was a character he could relate to. He was a guy that defied his family and defied everybody, not defied, but broke loose from them and completely fell in love with this girl and went for that 100% and committed his life to it to the point of like suicide. And it was a pretty profound character. Now, you just have this sort of cliche about anything that's Shakespeare because of, you know, you know, school and everything, you have to read it. It's like, oh, you know, get that stuff away from me. It's just like, you know, work. But when you really realize what's going on, it's a beautiful story, you know? Although Leonardo had been nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for the film What's Eating Gilbert Grape in 1993, his passionate Romeo put him in another league. This time he walked away with a Silver Bear for Best Actor and a Blockbuster Entertainment Award for Favorite Actor. But the film that shot him into the stratosphere was James Cameron's epic Titanic. At the time, the 1997 blockbuster, based on the ill-fated maiden voyage of the ocean liner, was the most expensive film ever made. The shoot itself was plagued with disasters. 20-hour days were not unheard of. And at one point, a disgruntled employee put PCP in the lobster chowder, poisoning 50 of the crew. To top it all off, Leo's co-star Kate Winslet was unable to attend the UK premiere due to a stomach bug. It was unlike anything I've ever done before. I'm sort of more used to smaller, independent type films, and this was like, you know, my first gigantic sort of venture into that, that whole world. And what was that like? I mean, so much has been written about, you know, problems on set. Yeah, I mean, we heard a lot of that going on, but while we were there every day sort of working, every day we didn't, we didn't really pay much attention to it because it was sort of almost like this sort of gossip snowball that went out of control and we just did our job. We knew the film wasn't sort of going to end and I knew when we just finished what we had to do, you know. Leonardo and Kate were cast as unlikely lovers, but the pairing of the stars and the sheer spectacle of the capsizing ship combined to make Titanic the highest grossing film of all time. It also drained the Oscar pool, sailing away with a total of 11 awards. Leonardo was not included, but he did win the MTV Movie Award for Best Performance and the Blockbuster Entertainment Award for Favorite Actor in a Drama. With Leo Mania sweeping the planet, he moved on to another epic, Man in the Iron Mask. Still only 23, he worked alongside heavyweights like John Malkovich, Gerard Depardieu, Gabriel Byrne and Jeremy Irons and held his own. He played two characters, the villain of the piece, King Louis XIV, and the hero, the king's secret twin brother, Philippe. He called on some expert help to make sure he mastered royal etiquette. How did it feel to be king? <clears throat> it was something that, that uh, was really exciting to me. Um, not only playing this dual role and, and having uh, two sides, two different characters to play, but for the first time playing you know, a, a venomous king and uh, somebody with a, basically an evil streak in him and a backbone, somebody that uh, that I could sink my teeth into was was really exciting. And you know, but first and foremost, it was the whole story and being involved with all the people that uh, were part of the film. You know, I mean, it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. Despite lukewarm responses from the critics, the film broke box office expectations thanks to the pulling power of its young star. Leonardo took his beloved grandmother to the premiere in London and presented her to Prince Charles, along with a replica iron mask. He topped off his first acting decade with a controversial project. The Beach was an adaptation of the dark novel by British writer Alex Garland, which follows the breakdown of a utopian community. 
It was filmed on idyllic Phi Phi Island in Thailand, but environmentalists balked at the prospect of a large film crew descending on a national park. Filming was halted for two weeks, while environmental scientists investigated. Leonardo sought assurances that the park would not be adversely affected and issued a press statement praising the country and its people. He also said he felt privileged to be filming in Thailand. The shoot itself was not without drama, with Leonardo spending half an hour in the shark-infested sea after a boat he was filming on sank. <laughs> Already a huge star, Leonardo was still only 26 when the 21st century began. Many young men party hard, and by all accounts, Leonardo was no exception. But his fame meant nothing could be hidden from view, and the decade started with legal troubles. He and good friend Toby Maguire had starred in a low-budget short film, Don's Plum, in 1995. But neither of them were keen for it to be released claiming it was never intended for public viewing. The director won the day, and the film premiered in 2001. The following year, he had the chance to work with two brilliant directors. Martin Scorsese's Gangs of New York was a period film in which Leonardo played a young Irish man keen to avenge the murder of his father. At Cannes, after a 20-minute excerpt was screened, Leonardo was the first to his feet, leading a standing ovation for the director. At an early age, I'd always wanted to work with, you know, Martin Scorsese. He's somebody that has mastered those, the mechanics of whatever it is to make a movie work. And, uh, you know, his, his characters and his films have had such a resonance with me throughout the years, and I've never forgotten them. And I've, there's all, he has such an acute attention to detail that there's always something new that you learn uh, about the characters and the world that he's trying to create on film. I've watched his movies repeatedly, but then then I got sent the script and I started to learn about this world and <clears throat> he said he wanted to do it with me. I was blown away and I learned about this world that he wanted to create about New York. Known for his meticulous character preparation, he recalled the unique development of his character Amsterdam Vallon. The character became more and more complex because, you know, we had this initial idea of this uh, of the samurai coming into a new dusty town and and what a samurai does he he doesn't divulge too much about how he feels about things you know we watch Yojimbo and Sanjuro and and we it was this constant you know uh, seesaw of, of how much he wants to you know relay to people around him about how he feels about things and 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 the more the more we started to work on the character the more human he became and the more he was influenced by his surroundings because you know we we established him as somebody that was had one singular thing on his mind his entire life and that was to reap revenge on his father but he was also orphaned and didn't have a, a father figure his entire life never experienced emotions for a woman never experienced success so how do these things transform his ultimate goal in the same year Leonardo played the lead in Catch Me If You Can Directed by Steven Spielberg, it was based on the true-life tale of con artist Frank Abagnale Jr., an impersonator who worked as a doctor, lawyer, and commercial airline co-pilot all before his 21st birthday. I knew in great detail and at great length about the different cons and how he pulled them off, but I really wanted to know what, you know, what internally drove him and what what he was thinking. And you know, I got I got an essence of that. You know, I I really. I understood his his need and his desire to do these things, but the way he engaged people and the way he made you focus on one thing as opposed to focused on him as opposed to the bad check. I mean, these are all elements that you know are almost like a magician. You know what I mean? Leonardo collaborated with Martin Scorsese again in 2004 when he took on another incredible true life story. This time, he played eccentric billionaire Howard Hughes in The Aviator. The lure of playing the mysterious genius proved irresistible for Leo. He was a champion aviator, you know, was at the, at the forefront of the you know, golden age of Hollywood. He had, you know, uh, built his own airline, revolutionized commercial travel in our country, was heavily involved in politics. He was America's first billionaire and slept with every possible woman 
imaginable, and he achieved everything. But all that combined with the fact that he was a germaphobe and had obsessive compulsive disorder, and the fact that all that genius then went into reverted to microscopic germs is one of the most fascinating stories about the human condition I've ever read. The critically acclaimed film garnered an enormous number of award nominations. And for Leonardo, it brought the thrill of winning the Golden Globe Award for Best Actor in a Motion Picture Drama. Although just playing Howard Hughes had been reward in itself. As an actor, there's been so many films made, so many films remade. There's only so many characters that are out there to play. And when you find somebody that is as multidimensional and still shroud is so shrouded in mystery to this day, people are literally obsessed with this man. You can't define him. So to be able to play a character that has all these different facets and read a book about him and say, look at this material that I have to work with. I don't need to make it up. This is the real man. He actually led this life. To be able to portray that is any actor's dream. In the same year, Leonardo returned to fictional characters in the thriller Blood Diamond. Set in 1999, the film explores the violence and brutality of forced labor diamond mining in Africa through the character of Danny Archer, a white South African searching for a rare pink diamond. Although he'd endured harsh shooting conditions before, he wasn't prepared for the rigors of filming in South Africa. It was the hardest shoot I've ever had to do in my life. Um, we were there for six months and some of the conditions were very rough, but you know, we all kind of felt that we were doing something really important with this movie. He was also overwhelmed by the terrible plight of many South Africans, and he worked with 24 orphan children from the SOS Children's Village in Mozambique. His work on Blood Diamond earned multiple award nominations, including another nod from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. But it was more important to him to get the film's message out there. Ultimately, you know, you, you first and foremost look for a film that does move you emotionally where you feel like, you know, there's a character that I could, you know, put some of my own take on and, and do something interesting with. But uh, the coolest part was, of course, that it does have this powerful social message to it. And it's so rare where a film of this sort of scale or magnitude that, you know, is highly entertaining to an audience also says something very pertinent about the world we live in and is very specific about on, you know, how we live in modern society. In 2006, Leonardo and Martin Scorsese teamed up once again, this time sharing the limelight with screen legend Jack Nicholson. The Departed was a remake of the Hong Kong thriller Internal Affairs, and the critics loved it. For once, Leonardo was on the side of the law, playing a young undercover cop who tries to break a mob syndicate run by Jack Nicholson and he was very happy to be back working with Martin. He's my favorite director. To me, he's the, you know, he is an American uh, icon as far as filmmaking is concerned and, and the greatest American living filmmaker. You know what I mean? Um, why wouldn't I? And I, I, he challenges me as an actor every time I step on set with him. He's like, an inner, he's like a database of film. You never stop learning from the man. And, you know, I, get a, I have a phenomenal working experience. The Departed proved to be one of Leonardo's most successful films, and he was nominated for 16 acting awards, of which he won six. Two years later, he reunited with his Titanic co-star Kate Winslet in the post-war drama Revolutionary Road, an adaptation of the 1961 Richard Yates novel. In a departure from more overtly dramatic roles, Leonardo shone as an ordinary man caught between dreams and reality. While many millionaires drive gas-guzzling Hummers or sports cars, Leonardo insists on driving a more environmentally friendly hybrid vehicle. Passionate about his environmental work, he was an early adopter of green energy and continues to use his celebrity power to bring his message to the public. It's half electric and uh, it's half uh, motorized and, they, and it's the way cars should be made. You know, we have the technology to make all cars like that. It's lower emissions and you get better gas mileage and the world would be a much cleaner, 
better place and we would just, you know, maybe affect global warming ultimately if every car was made like that in the world. In 2003, he spoke before a Rolling Stones charity concert on behalf of the Natural Resources Defense Council, a non-profit activist group. We are all here to keep the pressure on our politicians and our corporations to recognize the drastic implications of global warming. The word warming sounds almost inviting. Then in a world 20 years from now, we will all be living in a tropical paradise where the extent of our problems will be pondering which SPF sunscreen to use. But don't be fooled by semantics. Thousands of climate scientists agree that global warming is not only the most threatening environmental problem, but one of the greatest challenges facing all of humanity. In 2007, Leonardo brought together two of his loves when he produced and narrated The Eleventh Hour, an environmental documentary. The film put simple questions to a variety of environmental experts in the hope of empowering viewers to take more responsibility for the survival of our planet. Leonardo was influenced by Al Gore's famous documentary An Inconvenient Truth, which blazed a trail in raising public awareness of global warming. Determined to lead by example, he travels on commercial flights whenever he can. He believes everyone can make a difference, no matter how small. I drive a hybrid car. I, I have solar panels on my house. I, uh, I have energy efficient appliances and light bulbs and all those things. But I keep urging, uh, I, I don't want to send a mi mixed message out there when I talk about these issues because not everyone can necessarily put solar panels on their house. It, it's just not a reality and, and, and that's very understandable. The, the point of, I think, this whole exercise and everyone that's a part of this environmental movement is to get people understand that we need to vote not only with not only at the ballots by putting people in power that will actually m manifest some change to the point where we, we don't need to think about these things anymore, that they're automatically integrated with our everyday lives, but also we need to vote with our, our pocketbook and every time we pay for something we need to realize that we're advocating the way that that company does business and if we, if we buy green we're going to create a marketplace for that. He went on to receive the International Green Film Award for the 11th hour. It was presented to him by former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev at the Cinema for Peace Gala in Berlin. Leonardo DiCaprio has appeared in some of the most iconic and popular films of our times, and his face has become familiar to millions of people. For him, as for every superstar, that fame comes with a loss of privacy, which can be a heavy price to pay. In 1998, Leonardo had a taste of things to come when unauthorized nude photos of him were published in Playgirl. The same year, he went on holiday to communist Cuba, but couldn't escape his fans, who'd spent hours waiting for a glimpse of the star, or better still, an autograph. Like all major celebrities, Leonardo can never totally relax in public, knowing that any loose comment or inappropriate act could end up on the cover of a gossip magazine or be beamed around the world in news bulletins. But unlike many other actors who grow tired of all the attention, Leo has remained gracious, never tiring of questions from the press, who hounded him after his Oscar nomination for Blood Diamond. What was my reaction? To tell you the truth, I, I was screaming up and down, jumping up and down when when Jimon, when Jimon won. That was the first name I heard, and then and then my name came up, which was awesome, incredible, and and uh, you know more nominations came in for this movie than we than we really even predicted. But I couldn't be happier. You know, I couldn't be happier. This is a, this is a movie I'm very 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 proud of. Wherever Leonardo goes, the paparazzi are sure to follow. And if the daily media attention isn't enough, a new statue of Leonardo was recently commissioned for the famous wax museum Madame Tussauds, so the public can now gaze at a 3D version of him. Speaking at the Hollywood Awards' 8th Annual Hollywood Film Festival, where he won Actor of the Year for Aviator, he reveals why all the hard work is worthwhile. And as film progresses 100 or 500 years from now, for me to have been able to, been a, to have been a small part of this journey, journey truly is an honor and one 
that I feel very lucky to be included in, which is why this award is so encouraging and means so much to me as an actor, because I want nothing more than to continue to be a part of what I believe to be the great, memorable art form of our time and for my generation. As well as his desire to create art for posterity, Leonardo is also known for his interest in the here and now and is a dedicated follower of fashion. He's been spotted front row in a number of exclusive catwalk shows and is a regular guest at launches around the world. He makes no secret of his particular fondness for the elegant and understated designs of Italian designer Giorgio Armani. And he was recently one of a number of special guests invited to the opening of the new Armani store in New York. In 2008, he topped a competitive field of America's finest actors, sports stars and fashion models to take out the Leading Man of the Year Award, handed out by men's magazine GQ. Despite being arguably the most eligible bachelor in Hollywood, he rarely takes a girlfriend to premieres and awards events. Perhaps that could have something to do with his alleged claim that he was a slow starter with women, and that in the past, he never felt emotions or fallen in love. Certainly, however, that hasn't stopped him from dating a string of the world's most beautiful models. Back in 1996, at the age of 22, he was frequently photographed in the company of model Kristen Zhang. The story goes that Kristen ended their love affair shortly after the filming of Titanic in 1997, realizing that he was about to become a megastar, which would put too much pressure on the relationship. A few years later, the famous party boy was dazzled by Brazilian supermodel Giselle Bunchen, who, after appearing on three consecutive covers for Vogue, had been declared the most beautiful girl in the world by Rolling Stone magazine. Well on her way to becoming the highest paid model in the world, Giselle was proving to be much more than a pretty face, as her sparkling personality shone through in interviews and endorsements. Say hello to my little friend. <laughs> sparkle's enough for me. Is the sparkle enough for you? <laughs> Hi, this is Giselle. I'm here today at the Victoria's Secret photo shoot, shooting a new Victoria's Secret fantasy bra. In 2004, their famously on and off again relationship earned them the title of the most beautiful couple in the world, according to People magazine. However, confirmation of their final split the following year was closely followed by reports that Leo had found solace in the arms of yet another supermodel. This time, the object of his affections was 20-year-old Israeli beauty, Bar Raffaelli. Rather like Giselle, Leo's new younger model exuded plenty of glamour and glitz. The couple's attempts at making a low-key visit to Bar's home outside Tel Aviv two years later were thwarted by 17 journalists who just happened to be on the same flight after returning from a musical in Ireland. The unhappy coincidence sparked a media frenzy and paparazzi camped out on Bar's lawn, telephoto lenses at the ready. Two years later, amid rumours that Barr had been piling the pressure on Leo to settle down, came reports that the couple had split. However, in June 2009, Us Magazine Online declared that they were still a couple and were simply spending lots of time apart as a result of their mutually hectic schedules. <laughs> sailing away with a total of 11 awards. Leonardo was not included, 
but he did win the MTV Movie Award for Best Performance and the Blockbuster Entertainment Award for Favourite Actor in a Drama. With Leo Mania sweeping the planet, he moved on to another epic, Man in the Iron Mask. Still only 23, he worked alongside heavyweights like John Malkovich, Gerard Depardieu, Gabriel Byrne and Jeremy Irons and held his own. He played two characters, the villain of the piece, King Louis XIV, and the hero, the king's secret twin brother, Philippe. He called on some expert help to make sure he mastered royal etiquette. How did it feel to be king? <clears throat> it was something that, that uh, was really exciting to me, um, not only playing this dual role story, you know. Although Leonardo had been nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor, for the film What's Eating Gilbert Grape in 1993, his passionate Romeo put him in another league. This time he walked away with a Silver Bear for Best Actor and a Blockbuster Entertainment Award for Favourite Actor. But the film that shot him into the stratosphere was James Cameron's epic Titanic. At the time, the 1997 blockbuster, based on the ill-fated maiden voyage of the ocean liner, was the most expensive film ever made. The shoot itself was plagued with disasters. 20-hour days were not unheard of. And at one point, a disgruntled employee put PCP in the lobster chowder, poisoning 50 of the crew. To top it all off, Leo's co-star Kate Winslet was... From humble beginnings, Leonardo DiCaprio has become one of the most recognized actors of all time. An only child to a hard-working single mother, he came by his unusual name because his pregnant mother, Ermeline, was gazing at a painting by Leonardo da Vinci when she first felt him kick. The talented teenager grew up in the City of Dreams, Los Angeles, and got his first acting break when he was just 16. Six years later, it was an unlikely Shakespearean film that shot the young actor to international fame. Baz Luhrmann's ultra-modern Romeo and Juliet paired him with rising star Claire Danes, and Leonardo found that a star-crossed lover was a character he could relate to. He was a guy that defied his family and defied everybody, not defied, but broke loose from them and completely fell in love with this girl and went for that 100% and committed his life to it to the point of like suicide. I mean, it was a pretty profound character. Now, you just have this sort of cliche about anything that's Shakespeare because of, you know, you know, school and everything, you have to read it. It's like, oh, you know, get that stuff away from me. It's just like, you know, work. But when you really realize what's going on, it's a beautiful... He was unable to attend the UK premiere due to a stomach bug. It was unlike anything I've ever done before. I'm sort of more used to smaller, independent type films, and this was like, you know, my first gigantic sort of venture into that, that whole world. And what was that like? I mean, so much has been written about, you know, problems on set. Yeah, I mean, we heard a lot of that going on, but while we were there every day sort of working, every day we didn't, we didn't really pay much attention to it because it was sort of almost like this sort of gossip snowball that went out of control. and. We just did our job. We knew the film wasn't sort of going to end. And I knew when we just finished what we had to do, you know. Leonardo and Kate were cast as unlikely lovers. But the pairing of the stars and the sheer spectacle of the capsizing ship combined to make Titanic the highest grossing film of all time. It also drained the Oscar pool. 